In an ever-increasingly disconnected world, you may think making meaningful connections is impossible. But making friends as an adult is easier than you think. Take Andrew. Andrew has been working remotely for the last three years, and he needs some friends. With these simple tips, watch Andrew make some new friends. Here's a tip, ask thoughtful questions. May I ask you a question? Nice job getting permission. Have you had that mole checked by a professional? You just met him. But if I save his life, then he will become my friend. Nope, nope. Because I saved his life, you have to be friends with people that save your life. Let's try something else. Connect over pop culture. I also enjoy that television show. Great job, Andrew. It's crazy how everyone dies in that last episode. No, no, no. Oh, you didn't see, you haven't seen all of it? You can recover. Uh, well, you know, everyone dies in general. So it's really not a spoiler to say that everyone dies in a show because everybody dies all the time. Let's stop talking and work on eye contact. Andrew, Andrew, don't forget to blink. Maybe making friends as an adult is not as easy as we think. Good thing there's friendology. Let's tune in now. Sorry, what do I what do I do with my eyes to make him my friend? I, I'm not understanding. Oh man, I feel like that guy all the time in my life. Um, to get us going this morning, um, I, I had to give some of you an explanation of what happened in my life yesterday because some of you saw it. We celebrated my mom's 80th birthday this weekend with all of our family. Yeah, and she's back here. Um, Hey, and, and I gotta be fair about this. When it's your mom's 80th birthday, I'm not gonna mention her from stage. I have the microphone, sorry. That's just the way it works at Lifehouse. Anyway, so yesterday morning to get our day going to celebrate my mom, we all did one of our favorite things and we went for a walk with her, her and her grandkids and her one great grandkid and my sister, she did this interesting thing for my mom. She got everybody the same t-shirt which was all the same color, my mom's favorite color. And then she put my mom's baby picture, a little girl picture, on the front of our t-shirts. Now, I want to point this out because this is my grandson. Do you see Kelly? He's got his own little tiny t-shirt. Isn't that awesome? But my sister ordered me a triple X t-shirt. Which meant I went down the road with a tent on, a little embarrassed, and so I tied it around. And they would, so there's that whole thing. But here's the explanation. All of us were walking down the street together in these weird yellow t-shirts um, celebrating my mom. And if you drove by on Greenville Road, it looked kind of weird. It was not a cult. I promise you, it was just us celebrating my mom. And as we're walking, I'm walking all, watching all these people celebrate my mom's um, 80th birthday. I thought about this really interesting thing that not everybody has people to celebrate life with. In fact, here, here's what's fascinating. We'll take this weird picture off the screen. Here's what's fascinating um, off the screen. Here's what's fascinating. Um, he, there was an interesting thing that was um, delivered by the Surgeon General about a year or so ago that talked about an epidemic in our world and it wasn't another COVID experience or anything like that. This is what the Surgeon General said about a year ago, that there's an epidemic of loneliness and isolation in our culture. And when I say that, some of you are like, you know what, I've experienced this. I, the feeling of loneliness and being by myself. And for some people, it's not because you're alone, you're around people all the time, but you feel lonely. And in a world of all of our technology and social media, you think, how could you feel lonely? But it is a growing epidemic, according to our Surgeon General. And here's what's interesting. Certainly when the pandemic hit and we had to shelter in place, it threw gas on the fire of loneliness. But what we're finding out is years and years before pandemics hit our world, people were in this downward spiral of isolation by themselves. In fact, that about half our culture in America battles the feeling of being alone and, we, and would say things like this and this is what people are finding out through research people are saying listen I have to shoulder all this all of life's burdens by myself and, and just to pause do you ever feel like that it's all on my shoulders I got to carry the weight um, some people are saying phrases like if I disappear tomorrow no one will even notice I mean that's a heartbreaking statement and these are actually quotes that have come from a study over the last 50 years that people are feeling this way more and more and more and there's an increased feeling of being isolated in our culture 
And isolation leads to this feeling of being invisible when we are just in our existence of life. This is a plague for all of culture right now for all generations because we have a tendency to think, well, this is just for the younger generation. But we're finding for 40-year-olds and 60-year-olds and 80-year-olds, isolation is becoming a real problem. In fact, across our culture, people are spending 20% more of their time alone than they did 10 or 20 years ago. And it's leading to this feeling of insignificance. Like, why am I even here? Why does it even matter? Now, when you do go to the youngest generation that we you know, track as far as the workforce goes, um, Generation Z, we're finding the youngest generations are 70% more isolated than their previous generations were 10 years ago. It's a startling fact. And of course, this is partly because the dawn of social media and you can kind of hide out by yourself and feel like you're doing something with other people even though you don't. And it gets worse, and this is kind of sad, but hang on, there's good news coming, that 20% of Generation Z is clinically depressed and has deep suicidal tendencies. That's terrifying. And that's bad news, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. What also comes along with isolation is this mental um, strain of anxiety. And we hear this all the time in our schools. We hear it in our student ministries that there's anxiety and increased depression and stress along the way. It is like resiliency. And this is, no, this is not to blame anybody or be mad at anybody, but it's like resiliency is eroding as being replaced with self-destructive behavior. Again, it really shows up in the younger generation, but it's true for 40-year-olds and 80-year-olds along the way. And, and the weird thing, it's not just mental, because it just feels mental. It's, it's also physical in nature. In fact, we're tracking through research that isolation is causing more heart disease, more dementia, and more diabetes along the way. The, the Surgeon General in his report as he laid this out, discovered that there has been a 30% increase in heart disease and premature death because of isolation. And you might argue that's because of bad habits that come along, it's because of the stress and anxiety, but it literally equates to smoking 15 cigarettes a day to being severely isolated in your life. Now, if you're a smoker, we're not mad at you, but you just know cigarettes probably aren't the best thing for you. And this is huge when you think not just about the mental consequences, but also the physical. And there's also a social society impact um, with these risks. Academic achievement, dives, nose dives, career performance, and healthcare expense go south when people are isolated. Think about this last year. According to statistics, we spent more than $6.7 billion extra dollars to deal with isolation for our elderly, our seniors, people you know, on the other end of your life. It affects all areas of life. It also affects society in this way, economic prosperity, safety and resilience, and social and political directions. In fact, this is what they found after the pandemic, the COVID pandemic. And I don't care what you think about the pandemic. You just got to deal with, you know, the outcomes of it. That communities that were really isolated were three times slower to recover than communities that found ways, you know, to come together and live together and reconnect with one another. And if you want a good example, that Canada struggled incredibly because they just could not find ways to get out of their isolated has. And this is not just a religious problem. This is a human problem. And this is a problem that's happening in our nation. But it's not just our nation. It's happening in our community. And the truth is it might be happening in your home. And what do you do with that? Just so you know, the Surgeon General's conclusion about all this around connecting to other people. This is the Surgeon General, is that we are wired for social connection. It's like in our DNA. And personal connection, it improves personal health. I mean, literally your body does better when you're connected to other people. And and lastly, um, it's vital for social health. Communities are just better when we are connected to one another. Now, you may have showed up at church here and goes, okay, that's cool, Matt, but I didn't come here for a Surgeon General's report. I'm not even sure what his name is. So what's the big deal? The big deal is this is happening in our world, and it's like a drift away from connection into isolation. And you know what happens in these ways. We just get, we just get used to it, right? We just live with it. It just becomes a part of who we are. What I'm about to tell you has nothing to do with isolation. I just thought it was interesting for an illustration. Um, I, I was paging through the 
news online the other day and a headline came up about a woman in Australia and I wanted to show you the headline. It said, live worm found in Australian woman's brain in world's first discovery. If you weren't disturbed before church, now you're disturbed now, right? And this woman, she, she suffered from memory loss and she fatigue and nausea and she was losing weight and people had said, oh, you're getting older. This is just the effects of life. And then they did a brain scan on her and they found this guy in her brain right there. It's so creepy. I know some of you are like feeling around your head wondering, is that me? I feel weird in my head lately. This is a worm that usually hangs out in pythons and anacondas and somehow made its way into her brain and slowly affected her life, lowering the quality of life day by day. And she just kind of got used to it until she finally got it checked out. And I tell you that because I think isolation is having the same effect on you and I and our world and our culture. It's made its way in and we've just learned to live with it. But what if we decided to do something about it? It's why as we you know, head into the summer months, I wanted to talk about this new series called Friendology. The idea of how to forge meaningful friendships through dependency, diversity, and diligence. And, and for you to consider, and today's just the start of the series, how to create life-giving relationships in your life. To stop, to stop being so insulated. To stop being so isolated. To stop being so independent. And here's the thing. If you're a Christian, we know better than to do this. But Christians are falling into this trap. I know not everybody here is a Christian, which is one of our big wins that people come to our church that don't believe what we believe. But we're all falling into this trap that we can do life by ourselves. And way before, way before the Surgeon General ever started to discover this and research started to discover this, you know who, you know who knew about this? God knew about this. Because in the beginning, God created things. And you may not believe this, but we believe that God created us. And when you go all the way back to the beginning in the story of creation, and I always say this because some people are like, well, I don't believe in the story of creation. I don't believe in six days, and I don't think it's, I don't care, that's fine. You, you can believe whatever you want. Here's what I'd love for you to hang with me in, that the story of creation tells us about God and it tells us about ourselves. It tells us who's behind this all. I happen to believe in the story of creation. If you don't, I just want you to think about maybe there is a creator and how we were meant to be. Because God created something out of chaos. We're told that when God hovered over the water, there was chaos, there was disruption. And what God did is he took the chaos and he created order out of the chaos. And day by day he created. And every time he created, he took chaos and put order into it. And you know what chaos is in your world. It's when, you know, the kitchen's a mess and the kids aren't dressed and there's no food in the pantry and you prefer, forget to put gas in the car and that's a disaster and it's just chaos and you get to work and everything's disheveled. God brought order to the world. And when he looked at the order he created, I love this so much. He said, this is good. It's good for you. It's good for creation. And in some weird way, it's good for God because it pleased him. But when there was chaos, when God was hovering over the water, chaos was not good. It wasn't beneficial. It was not good for humanity and God's creation. So day after day, God created and brought order to chaos. And I love this. About day five, when you actually read the text, God has a creative brainstorm meeting. Now, for some of you, you're creative and you can create by yourself in a room, lock the door. You can just come up with cool things. For me, you need to know I can be a little creative, but I've got to be around people. And if you put me with people, I mean, I can talk and think and come up with ideas and then I tell other people to do them. That's the best part of my life. I love that. But God had a creative brainstorming meeting in if you don't understand the context, it can sound a little weird, but this is what Moses tells us when he wrote this. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. And this little thing of let us, like there's more than one person in this conversation, but it's God seemingly to having a conversation with himself. And we're introduced to the theological idea 
And theological idea just means what we believe. That's all it means. It's been around for a thousand plus years. It's orthodoxy, which means it's a normal way of seeing God, that God is made up. God is made up. Next slide. Of three persons. And the, and the three persons are the Father, the Son and the Spirit. Now this can throw you, and if you think too much about it right now, if this is all new to you, um, it will get you in a wrong direction. The Father, the Spirit, Son are all the personalities of God in God. We call it the Trinity. And I almost put a picture of Trinity from the Matrix up where she's flying through the air and kicking people in the face, but I knew that would distract all the men in the room, so I didn't want to put that up. But it's the idea of the Trinity, which means three in one. That there's three parts of God that make up one God. And so these three parts, they get together and they say, hey, let us make mankind, you and I, in our image. This is our most creative thing that we can do. And in our likeness. Now, if you've gone to cool places around the world, you may have ran into one of the most famous cool paintings that has ever been painted on a ceiling. It's this image um, in the Sistine Chapel. It's Michelangelo's um, Imago Dei. And I love this picture. This is one of those things that you ought to look it up on the internet when you get home and just look at it a little bit because it's his version of God in heaven straining. And I love what he does here. He strains towards man. And man is just kind of casual, kind of at ease. Like I might be connected to God, I might not. I'm not sure if I want to, but God is desperate to get towards man. Side note, I cropped the picture because in the original painting, you can see way too much, and I thought it'd be church appropriate to crop the picture, so I did that for you all. But this is Imago Dei. It's the image of God, that we would be connected to God. And so when we think about God and the Father, Son, and the Spirit. We are made in God's image. And maybe you've never thought about this, that when you were created as a people, when we were created as a people, you were created to mirror God, that you are the best reflection of anything in cre creation of the creator. There's nothing else like you and there's nothing else like me in the world. And this is a huge deal that we were supposed to be a reflection of God in heaven. Hang on to that for a minute, because remember, there's three parts to God, and they're having conversations like, let us make man in our image. Then there's a problem. Literally on the second page of creation, there's a problem. And the first problem is not sin. That's what we all think. The first bad thing that happened, or the third, first problem in creation was sin. It wasn't. God identifies the first problem in creation. He says, the Lord God said, it is not good, and God does good things, it is not good for the man to be alone. Because when man is alone, it's chaos. When man is isolated, it's chaos. And some of you could speak to that, couldn't you? Some of you could speak to a time in your life where you decided, I'm just gonna go my own way. I'm just gonna come up with my own thoughts. I'm not gonna listen to anybody. I'm not gonna listen to anything. I'm just gonna decide everything for myself and you wrecked your life. And you look back through your college years, your young adult years, your 40s, your first marriage, your second marriage, and chaos and loneliness caused you to go in places you wish you never went. And you would say, yeah, I can look back now and I can see that I was isolated. Next slide that I was isolated along the way. And isolation caused chaos in my life. And God would just say, yeah, it's because I didn't design you to be alone. There's no lone rangers in God's economy because even the lone ranger, if you're old enough to remember, had Tonto along the way. There is no lone rangers. And for some of you, this is a pushback for you right now. Because this is a pushback for me. Because maybe you're introverted, maybe you're self-dependent, and you decide, you're just like, I can beat my chest, I can make it along the way. I just want you to know that God would say chaos came from man being alone, apart from God and apart from other human beings. The biggest chaos is through isolation, where mankind is by himself. You weren't designed for that. And that's not just mankind, that's humankind. And I want you to get tripped up on this because in this mankind word in the original Hebrew language, this is just a side note, 
It is not the word ish, which is mean, literally means man. It's the word Adam, which means Adam or mankind, humankind, which means everybody plays in this, men, women, and children. It is not good for mankind to be alone. Um, not too long ago, there was a really famous TED Talk called What Makes a Good Life by Robert Waldinger. And Robert Waldinger was um, a person that took over a study that was started in 1938 by Harvard, like Harvard, the important Harvard, where they followed 724 people throughout their life. This, this went on from 1938 to just recently. And most of those folks are passed away now, but they tracked their entire life where they would keep coming back to these same people over and over throughout their life and say, hey, what is making life good? And what's making life bad? Fulfilled or unfulfilled? And they just kept asking him the same questions over and over through the, every stage of life. This TED Talk has been viewed like millions and millions of times because it's resonated in people's hearts. The conclusion of this multi-decade research was this. That people who were the most satisfied, you know, you want to be satisfied. I want to be satisfied in their relationships at age 50 were the healthiest at age 80. I want to read that again so you don't miss it. The people who were the most satisfied in their relationships at age 50 were the healthiest at age 80, which runs against how we normally think. Because what makes you happy at 80? When I'm the richest? No. Nope. When I exercise the most? No. Nope. Although you should exercise, it is good for you. When you eat the best, nope. Did you hear when I said I made eight racks of ribs yesterday? Thank you, Jesus, there's something besides eating healthy. Or I'd be in a lot of trouble. That's not it. All those things are important. But what makes you happiest at 80 is when at 50, you have meaningful, healthy relationships. It is not the stuff of life at the end that brings happiness. And that feels so cliche. And you've heard pastors say it over and over. The research caught up to what God said thousands of years earlier. The stuff's fine. But it is relationships at the end of the day that matters most. This was the conclusion of this Harvard study, that positive relationships keep us happier, healthier, and help us live longer. And this is not a self-help sermon. This is not a self-help church. This just points back to all the way to the creation that God simply said, it is not good for man to be alone. It is not fulfilling, it is not blessing, it is not joyful to be alone. This is how I created man, God would say. This is, what, this is why God said there's not a super, suitable helper for him. We did not design him or her to be alone. It's why when you go back to this idea of the Trinity and the Father and the Son and the Spirit, think about this, this is a little overwhelming. That God, with these three persons, the Father, Spirit, and the Son, they dwelt together for all eternity. For all eternity, these three personalities were together in relationship, close, intimate relationship. It's why when Jesus finally showed up as the Son of God on the planet, he would have these conversations with his Father. And then when you read them, it's like, how can you be so close to your daddy, Jesus? And he would just look at you and say, because I've been with him forever in past and I'll be with him forever in the future. It's why when Jesus was on the cross and apparently there's happened, something happened because Jesus was bearing our sin and for that moment he was separated from his father. He cried out in anguish because he was never exposed to that kind of separation from his heavenly father. And then the Spirit of God would come when Jesus left and take Jesus' place and it would bring power and God would honor the Son and the Son would honor the fa Father and the Spirit would empower everything that they're doing and you're doing as a Christian in this world. It is a beautiful picture of, it's a beautiful picture of community. Not your community, the community of heaven. And here's the beautiful part. Leave the slide up here. You were made a mago day. You were made in the image of God. And the image of God is a reflection of community. 
Here's what I'd love for you to wrestle with just today. We're, we're going to go through this series and we're going to figure out how to navigate all these relationship things, but you got to grab onto this first. You were made in your DNA for the capacity to have community with other people. But see, sometimes we think about, oh, I have capacity to do it. But it's just not just capacity to have relationships with other people, community with other people. You have the necessity to have relationships with other people, to do life with other people, to do life with people that can help carry your burdens and you can carry theirs. And that's where we flourish and we're blessed and we reflect the image of our heavenly father. Again, that's why God said there's no suitable helper is found for Adam. And so I'm gonna fashion a companion. And if you haven't read this story, you should go home and do this. But the story goes, he took Adam's rib and from his side, he pulled that rib out, which is weird, and he formed woman, woman, and she was his helpmate. But we would say not just his helpmate, she was his help meet. And that's a weird world word, but it's like she was his equal. There was no one else on the planet like her or like him, and they were side by side walking through life together. Now, here, here's something I want to say, maybe a side note. That's why I'm convinced. The healthiest thing in our culture is family. Hang on if that feels weird to you or offensive to you because I want to explain that. I am convinced that God created the nuclear family, mama and dad and children, to be the healthiest thing on our planet. And you know this if you said, well, what, Matt, do you really think people and kids need a mama? Everybody would say, yeah, kids need a mama. Do you really think kids need a dad? Yes, I really think that kids need a dad. That is the best picture in our world for a healthy family unit. Here's the challenge. One out of every four human beings is estranged from one of their close family members. Because since 1970, the erosion of the nuclear family, mom and dad and kids, has been on an eroding slide in a negative direction. And I think God knew this. So, first of all, if you're in the nuclear family and mom and dad, you're all in a house with your kids, keep working your tails off. Keep loving and forgiving and giving your life to each other and hang on to Jesus and keep coming and figuring it out. It is worth it. But in the broken world we live in, the nuclear family doesn't always work out perfectly because everybody needs a dad, but sometimes dads leave. Or sometimes dads aren't good dads and moms leave and vice versa. But I think that's why when Jesus showed up on the planet, he knew how broken we would all be. And that's why he would say, listen, I'm bringing a new kingdom and there's going to be brothers and sisters and moms and dads that are in my kingdom that aren't even physically biological family. And that's the language we're going to use. These are my brothers and these are my sisters. It's why Jesus would say, I want you to talk to God like he's your heavenly father. Yeah, my earthly father's not around anymore. I know you have a heavenly father that loves you. In fact, in a kind of a weird account, Jesus was teaching one day on the side of a hill and we're told this in Matthew, that someone told Jesus, your mother and your brothers are standing outside wanting to speak to you. And when I read this this week, I thought, man, why is Mary, Mama Mary standing outside and not inside? That's another question for another time. But they said this to Jesus, your mom and your brothers are looking for you. Then this is what happens. He replied to them, Jesus replied to them, who is my mother and who are my brothers? Pointing to his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers, which is a little bit weird because he pointed to Peter and goes, there's my mother and my brothers. So it's a little strange. But what Jesus is implying is, listen, you can be part of a community that can feel like your mother, your brother, your father, your friends, and it can be that close together. And I don't think Jesus is saying, you know, reject your biological family. I think it's still the most important thing, this side of heaven for health. But we can gather in community, is what I think Jesus is saying. And for all the broken things in our lives, you got an absent dad, you got an absent mom, your family's super dysfunctional, you can find life-giving friendships and relationships that can tie you together. But you got to work at it. It's why in another place, Jesus would say, and I think it's so connected to this, that this is my commandment. You gotta love each other in the same way I have loved you. Jesus, I'm not sure how to love the way you loved, and Jesus would just point to the cross. 
This is how you have healthy relationships. You give everything for people in your life. And when you give and they give, you are tied together in the most beautiful way. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. The good thing for you and I is this does not mean we're probably going to die on a cross. But it means we've got to sacrifice. We've got to defer. We've got to forgive. We've got to lean in. We've got to commit. We've got to you know, make time. And a culture is so opposed to this. That's why if we're going to do this and have life-giving relationships, it's going to take diligence. It's going to take work. When you were you know, growing up as a kid, it wasn't work because you just hung with your friends because that's just what you did. A lot of people will say, listen, the best years of my life for college or when I was in the military because we just all hung out in the dorm room together. There was built-in time for relationships. But then we grow up and you know, it's busy and we're trying to survive and make a living and you're working 80 hours a week. And this may be kind of you know, offensive to some of you, but most of our relationships, most of our relationships turn practical, functional, and transactional. Practical is, hey, you're my roommate, so I'll, I'll talk to you because I have to. You're, you're my wife, I'll talk to you because I have to. It's functional because I'll hang out with my kids' friends' parents because we're all at the ball game together. It's functional, but it's not deep and it's not meaningful. It's transactional because if I do for you, you'll do for me. I've got to work with you and we'll work together and we'll make this work. This is not community. This is why we're in such an isolated place. This is why we've got to figure out diligence when it comes to our relationships. I won't talk much about this, but I'll just say this because it's so much on my mind. I showed you that picture of our family when we were walking in our t-shirts. You know, you know why? We were all walking together, acting like idiots on the highway in a weird shirt with my mom's picture on our chest because my mom showed diligence in relationships when we were growing up and to my kids and to my grandkid. When we do that and we lean against culture not to be isolated, our world changes. But you have to put in the hard work because when where we go naturally, where we all go naturally, is to practical, functional, and transactional. But this is not community. Because when I'm just in a functional relationship with other people, they're not asking me the hard questions, are they? And I need somebody in my life to ask me the hard questions. When I'm just in a transactional community, I'm not being cared for and I'm not really caring for other people. I'm just trying to get something from them. When I'm in this kind of relationship with people, there's not people that are going, hey, how's your faith doing? Are you spending time, are you spending time with Jesus? Are you loving your wife? And as I've talked about this, some of you have had a name come to mind and you're like, yeah, yeah, that's a relationship that's pretty practical and transition, transactional and functional. So, so just to recap, you go all the way back to the beginning. In the beginning, there was chaos. And, and it wasn't good because chaos is never good in our lives. But God, the Father, God, the Son, and God, the Spirit, they brought order to chaos and it was oh it was good God looked at you and said that's good relationships are good but chaos had isolation and mankind was alone and so God came up with this creative process to do the most creative thing that's ever happened in the world he created man in his image imago Dei to be a reflection of God, not equal to God, not you know, close to being like God, but a reflection of God and who he was and is. And in that was community, where we'd have help meet in our lives to walk beside us through the challenges of life. This happened thousands and thousands of years ago. Just recently, just recently, the Surgeon General said this, if we fail to build a more connected society and live more connected lives, we will pay an ever-increasing price in the form of our individual and collective health and well-being. He goes on and he says, and we will continue to splinter and divide until we can no longer stand as a community or as a country. Anybody feeling that right now? In our country, in our world? 
Instead of coming together and take on the greater challenges before we will further retreat to our corners. And this just challenged me. We'll retreat to our corners angry, sick, and alone. Anybody feeling a little too angry right now? Anybody feeling a little sick? And God bless you, anybody feeling a little alone? What's going to change this? And I don't want you to give any preconceived answers. I just want you to hear this next question in this season we're in. Do you really think the next president, whoever it might be, is going to change this for you? We're angry because we've bought into the lie that somehow a government changes us from the inside out. Is it the next congressman? Is it the next, next pill? Is it the next fad? What if we went all the way back to the way we were created and that was to have life-giving, meaningful relationships? And here's the thing for the church people in the room. And if you're not, you can just watch us squirm with this. We have messed this up royally along the way. Collectively, the church has. You guys have done pretty well, but we've messed this up because we've gotten angry as a church and we've been against more things as a church and we're always pointing our finger at how wrong the other side is, whatever that is. And maybe it's a reflection that we just are too alone and isolated in this world. What, what if we decided we're going to be a community that really cares and loves about each other? Uh, you know, on a one-on-one -on -one relationship, in our corporate gatherings, in our small groups, in the way we raise our kids. And we could pull people in, which would start with us, and we go back to the very beginning that chaos is not good and order is good. Isolation is not good, but community is good. And it's a reflection of our Father in heaven. And we'd be connected. And we have life-giving relationships. Now, just so you know, at the end of this today, there's no worship song that we're going to sing a song and it's going to make everything better in this way. There's nothing that we're going to say a prayer and all of a sudden we're going to have relationships that are like God intended us to. We have to be diligent. We have to be like Jesus. We have to ask him for his help and lean in here in our community and maybe just in our own home. But what if chaos became order and community made us reflect the image of God in the way we love people in our lives. The next two weeks, we're going to talk about how to navigate and walk through these ideas. I would love for you to come back, join online as you miss it. I just want you to know you are created in God's image for something more than just struggling alone through this life because he loves you. They gave Jesus for you, which opens up the doors to all kinds of life-giving relationships. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I don't know where this lands for everybody today. For some, this is such an easy concept to grab onto. And for others, this just feels like it's a million miles away. I pray, Jesus, that it would first start with you and the Father and the Spirit and what community really looks like. And what you gave in your diligence to be with us. And help us to start leaning in, not to be isolated with our technology and our private homes and our own cars and our ways to escape it, Lord, that we would know that people are important for our life and for their life. And thank you for wanting to be with us in the middle of it all. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Guys, thanks for being here. We'll see you next week for part two of Friendology. Have a good day.